doing it. Um, so one of the examples you actually used was to do with uh, medicine and the medical side of things. And I think that will tie in nicely with our next speech, uh, which is from, uh, it's on open source tools in machine learning applied to medical imaging. And that's by uh, Joe Hobbs and Sarah Lorio from Bayer Life Hub UK. So I will hand them the stage. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so we're just going to kick off um, with a really, really short introduction of, um, well, to uh, what the Life Hub is and um, how we sit as part of Bayer. And then I'm going to hand over to Sarah for um, the technical bit that you're really interested in. Um, so I will just whiz through. Um, so we've got a number of Life Hubs based across the globe. And they really provide us with the uh, perfect springboard to connect with the community that's out there. Um, we're looking to explore impactful answers through collaborations and incubate solutions by building new skills, technologies and business models. Um, we are also uh, looking to partner with experts wherever we can um, to really kind of drive innovation. So each of the different life hubs across the globe has a slightly different uh, theme or focus. And our ambition is all centered on connecting with partners to jointly explore, discover and develop leading patient centric AI solutions in image guided diagnosis and therapy. Our vision is to connect uh, with the community through networking, mentoring and meetups um, and just really facilitate discussions around um, AI applications and digital technology within healthcare and see where we can take that. So I'm sure I don't have to tell you um, that the Thames Valley and Reading are um, a real hub for digital technology. And um, the Life Hub UK is based out of Green Park in Reading, which is uh, Bayer's kind of central area for the UK. Um, and obviously, um, tech investment is a huge uh, growth area for the UK economy. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sara, who is our technical lead for the Life Hub, and um, she's going to give you a presentation. Over to you, Sara. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction. So um, as Joe already mentioned, we are part of the Bayer Life Hub UK. Our goal is to um, be involved into new research projects starting with uh, the ideation of a new research, following with uh, uh, the development of a proof of concept. And then finally, if the project goes ahead and is developed as a, uh, as a product, this product is submitted to regulatory entities such as FDA or EMA. We work very much. Our Sarah, goal. I don't want to interrupt you, but your sound um, is like really, really echoey. I don't know if there's anything you can do about that. <laughs> is it better? Okay, I hope you can hear me. Um, so, uh, as I was mentioning, um, as Life Hub UK, we uh, focus on um, um, digital diagnostics and radiology. So that's why tonight I I decided to talk about open source uh, tools in machine learning applied to medical imaging. What we need from the research perspective and also from a regulatory perspective. Uh, so, um, in terms of uh, AI tools um, for, um, uh, for uh, med medical imaging, what we talk here is about uh, a very wide range of, um, of topics, starting from the image acquisition. Uh, so, for example, when, when the image is acquired, we can improve the image reconstruction by shortening, for example, uh, the acquisition time with the uh, machine learning models, 
for uh, reducing the noise in the acquired image, noise produced by movements in the patients or movements of the organs that have been scanned. And then moving ahead, um, we have machine learning tools nowadays that aims at segmenting organs or, or tissues in the body. Uh, and also we can, for example, detect and identify pathologies such as oncological lesions and monitor those lesions across different time points. So the uh, final goal is to gather uh, quantitative data in order then to um, extract information about patient prognosis, disease progression, um, patient stratification for certain clinical trials, and ultimately to lead to better patient assessment. So these are mainly the topics that we deal with on LIFA. So you can see that all these topics we use um, medical imaging and uh, currently Biomedical imaging has been acquired in huge amounts by hospitals, so machine learning tools really can leverage onto huge amount of data. Uh, but most of all, um, these uh, machine learning tools can help with the patient assessment and also with uh, improving the workload of the, of the clinical team. However, it's important to note that before any uh, machine learning or AI tool is applied, we need to process the data and we need to follow certain steps. So machine learning is the, at the very end of the process. Therefore, in the following slides, I will talk a little bit about what are the important steps that are required before applying machine learning or are the open source tools available that we also uh, use. So from a clinical perspective, uh, the workflow from acquiring the image is the following. So the image get, is acquired by scanner being an MR, CT, and the output of the data of medical imaging data is DICOM. So the DICOM format um, is a format that includes not only uh, the, the image of the anatomical area that is scanned, but also it has as well personal uh, information details about the patient, uh, information about the, the, uh, the, the scanner that is used to acquire the image, how the image has been acquired, when. This data then uh, is um, stored in a pack, sent over to a PAX machine, picture archiving and communicating system machine, and finally it is uh, visualized onto a radiology uh, workstation where the radiologist assess and writes a radiological report about it. So in this step already, there are some open source tools that play a crucial role. For example, the um, DICOM format um, has been standardized through open source libraries, the DICOM toolkit libraries, which are really important for standardizing the format of medical imaging. And also, they have important functionalities to check, to assess the quality of the images, because they prevent maybe duplicates files to be sent over, to be overwritten, uh, or they check that all the slides get sent over so they, are, um, uh, they can be reviewed uh, by, the, um, by the clinicians. In terms of the PAC systems, um, normally hospitals have their own PAC systems, so there are different vendors that provide them for cost. But there are as well open source uh, tools for doing it. Park systems are very important because they archive pictures coming from different sources, MRI, CT, PET, ultrasounds, and they allow to uh, share these images with other um, systems within a hospital or an organization. So for example, they send these images over to electronic medical records or to the radiology uh, information system. In terms of what is 
freely available. Um, there are two like CAOPS or extensible uh, mirror imaging access toolkits which can be freely available and can be used. They are used mainly in research though, not in hospitals. Um, there are also um, uh, tools which uh, run on a, a patch Tomcat server. So these usually require you to have a local server where you can store um, your data. However, this is where the clinical workflow stops. When we talk about AI tools, we go some steps ahead. So coming back to uh, the imaging data, before feeding into a machine learning model, we need to de-identify it first. So removing uh, to remove personal information, curate it, uh, meaning we might need to change the format, uh, store it in a way that is accessible by the machine learning tool, annotate it, and reprocess it. So on the next slide, I'm going to spend a few words about these steps. Just briefly about the curation. So here, normally, the, as I said before, the imaging data is acquired into a diagram format, but this format is not really practical for um, to develop machine to train and test machine learning algorithms because it's very heavy. It contains a lot of information that are not useful, and um, it also fragments a lot of the data. So, for example, the data comes as a 2D, while in for medical imaging we know it's a 3D data. So there are freely available tools that allow to change the format uh, to uh, more usable ones. And these tools um, are, for example, MLI, CronGL, DCM, Tumi, IX, Brain Voyager. So most of them have um, command lines interface to use them, uh, or they have as well uh, a GUI interface. Um, or they, have, they are based into uh, they are based on, on JavaScript. So you have, for example, Java for diagrams. Um, in terms of the the identification, uh, what we need to do with the identification is remove all personal information from the data, mainly from the diagram tags. Uh, but also remove any link to uh, the personal identifiable information which are related to electronic health records, biological data, or any other source of data recorded by the health providers. And this is the first step. So the tools that I um, mentioned before for curating the data can also provide a way to remove this personal uh, patient information, but it's not enough because sometimes, for example, in the case of uh, MRI uh, of the brain, you can as well reconstruct part of the anatomy that allows you to identify the, uh, identify the patient. So, for example, if you acquire a brain of the, um, an MRI of the brain with high resolution, you could reconstruct the 3D phase. And then you can match the face with a um, picture of the patient. So you need to remove that. You need practically to the face it. Remove all the boxes that belong to the face. Um, and here there are open source tools such as uh, FSL um, that, or Brain Voyager as well that allow you to uh, only identify the face, segment it, and remove it from the data. Then the next step is annotation. So here um, it depends, this step really depends on the task for which you are developing an algorithm. Uh, basically, annotation meaning uh, segmenting, manually segmenting involves the manual segmentation of tissues, organs, pathologies. You need medical experts to perform this task because here it's not like a labeling pictures of cats and dogs, but it really requires clinical expertise. 
and there are many free available software, open source software that you can download uh, and integrate into your pipeline. So here I just um, mentioned two. One is 3D Slicer that has manual annotate, combines manual annotations with the possibility also to perform semi-automatic annotations. So it saves a little bit of time because this is a very time-consuming task to perform and very expensive because uh, it requires experts and their times. Another one is ITK staff. They are some of them that are easier to use, some of them require uh, a bit of training. The important thing to keep in mind is that these tools are free, but if you later want to submit your um, product to regulatory authorities, uh, the annotation tools need to be approved by the regulatory authorities too. And the majority of freely available softwares are not. So until you do a research project, those are fines, but when you want to move further, and sell it this uh, sell these tools, then you might need to go into not open source solutions. And then finally, um, image processing. So once you get your data annotated, you might want to perform some process, some steps before a machine learning algorithm is applied. So these steps uh, aim at uh, doing certain things, and the, the steps uh, uh, mainly depend on the image modality that you are using, uh, on the image quality, uh, and the fact that maybe you mix different modalities or uh, even different images from the same patients. So the most common steps are, for example, noise removal, and there you can use uh, many different to, uh, filters to, to cancel or suppress the noise, to smooth the data. You might want to change the resolution of, your, of the data. So typically the, the, the data is acquired with a certain resolution, but this might not be uniform across the whole data set. Mostly, most of the time it's not. So you might, you might want to down or upsample your data set. And then if you acquire uh, images from for the same subject, but multiple images, you want to register different modalities or different images at slightly different points because the patient moves, the organs move as well. And here you have <clears throat> several tools available depending on the image registration that you want to perform, whether it's a linear or non-rigid registration. Then uh, you might want to normalize data, the intensity of your data, so that it's all within the same range, and that would make things easier for um, your machine learning tool. Uh, and finally, you might even want to augment the data, so you put, you confound the data with a little bit of noise in order to create sort of new data sets. Um, again, here I just put some of the libraries that we use, we develop mainly Python, and we use uh, open source libraries to perform the steps, but this is, of course, is not an exhaustive uh, list of the libraries that we use. Then finally, once you have performed all this, you have acquired the data, curated, annotated, and processed, you develop your machine learning tool. Um, you train, you test it, and you are happy with the results. Okay, let's move it forward. Let's move forward and um, apply it into a clinical settings. This is the big hurdle uh, because there are a certain a number of challenges um, that are present into the application for the application of of these tools into the clinical domain. This is. One of the reasons why many research projects don't go ahead are not applied currently uh, within the NHS or other um, healthcare systems. But, um, <clears throat> one challenge, for example, is the problem of tracking. So an algorithm need to be able, you, you need to be able when you use a certain machine learning algorithm to understand why an algorithm fails and track back the origin of the problem. 
So you have to understand what's the, um, for example, the root cause of a negative outcome when the outcome should be should have been positive, for example. So you need to be able to identify it so that you can then further uh, prevent it in the future. Another problem is the reclassification and constant training. So the power of, mach of uh, machine learning algorithms is that can, they can learn continuously. So um, the problem is that when you sell an algorithm, a machine learning uh, tool uh, for clinical purposes, normally the code is frozen. You are not allowed to change it so easily. Every time you change it, you need to reapply, for example, for uh, a regulatory approval. And this is a problem that is not yet very well uh, tackled by regulatory uh, entities. And another issue that you need to face is the human computer interaction. So, for example, uh, the way uh, AI tool is, is used might be very different from the way, from the, the goal for which it was developed. Someone either on purpose or by mistake could feed, for example, incorrect data into the system that would cause to, uh, that would lead to errors, be misdiagnosis or incorrect treatment recommendations. So luckily, uh, detection algorithms are designed to identify uh, incorrect inputs and could reduce, if not eliminate, uh, the risk of such misuse of algorithms. But this is what you will need to take into account when bringing um, a product into uh, the, the clinical environment. So here in this graph, I just want you to point out um, some of the algorithms that have been developed in the last five years uh, and have been approved by regulatory uh, for um, radiology and digital diagnostics. <clears throat> so as you can see, the number of tools each year increase exponentially. Um, although uh, the academic community developed uh, these tools and start as well to uh, develop reporting guidelines for AI clinical trials. There are no yet established best practices for evaluating commercially uh, available algorithms and ensure their reliability and safety. So, for example, um, it's still not clear how you can demonstrate the performance of uh, of an algorithm onto um, the whole population. Um, you need to have a very big data set and very diverse data set in order to avoid overfitting uh, the data to have um, data shift and bias against underrepresented patient subgroups. So just to give you an idea of what I mean, um, here is a, is a work by Hu and colleagues published this year in Nature. Um, this research group just looked for um, AI tools uh, that AI model developed for radiology uh, that have been approved by uh, FDA. They looked for tools that had um, a clear description about the number of patients enrolled in evaluation studies, the number of sites, um, um, whether the uh, test data was collected and evaluated concurrently with the device deployments, meaning prospective data sets, or if the test data was collected before the device uh, deployment. Meaning retrospective data set. Uh, and they also subdivide this into disease subtypes, uh, across demographic, and additionally, they assign a risk level from one to four to each device. One, a risk one and two indicate low risk of, for the device to be used in clinical settings. Three to four indicate high risk. So in the end, they came out with um, 130 tools available uh, approved by FDA that they could find data for. Um, and um, what 
they found out is that, for example, the majority of these data sets um, were um, just uh, the majority of these um, tools were developed for retrospective data. So the tool is not able to learn as, um, as long as it, it is presented with new data. Uh, only four tools are developed for uh, within the prospective studies. Then again, the majority of these tools uh, have been used, have been trained without multi sites evaluation. Uh, uh, the majority again are used in low for low risk tasks within the clinical settings. So as you can see, there are a lot of improvement required with the current devices and also with the regulation. Um, <clears throat> so more prospective studies are needed for these tools because um, we need to understand how well the tool performs when it's presented with new data and how well it learns. Um, then we also need to have more multi sites uh, data set for this uh, for the evaluation of these tools because um, there are underrepresented um, populations uh, in the geography uh, different part of the world for which these tools might work differently and um, AI tools need to accurately capture through clinical outcomes. So post-market surveillance of AI uh, devices is needed to understand and measure unintended outcomes and bias, um, not being detective in uh, prospective studies. Uh, and finally, the pr these problems might arise as well from uh, the lack of multi-site data sets. As I mentioned before, annotating data, not just curating, but annotating the data is time-consuming and very expensive task to perform. So in terms of open source community, what can be done is, for example, to include open source tools that would require an uh, open source data set, sorry, that would allow us not just to test the algorithms on several sites, different um, ethnicity of the population, but also it would allow, it would improve the collaboration between the sites because data sharing is another big hurdle for this community and it, it is affected by the fact that there are regulations within each country that um, might um, forbid to share data with different centers uh, or require the use of different learning techniques that are not optimal to, to be used with uh, medical imaging. So one step ahead would be to create really and to improve open source um, public data sets. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and open the question. Thank you for that. That was a very interesting uh, presentation and it touched on some really key points, especially around the regulation and the use of uh, AI and machine learning in healthcare, I think. Um, I think it's something that's gonna, we're gonna see a lot more of in the future, especially with the regulation. And it's gonna be a major issue that needs fixing, I think, because there isn't a lot of uh, precautions taken with it and it's very outdated. So I think it's definitely where the future is heading and it can help with a lot of the issues that we are facing at the moment. Uh, are there any questions? No, I don't think we have any questions. Uh, so we can move on to the next.